Well, hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> interesting how far fewer seats are filled than at the beginning of the course. Um, so that, of course, we're in the, the final stretch of this course. You're working on the last lab. And um, the material that we're covering, both this lecture and next lecture, are not on the exam. And you don't need them for your lab. So at some level, you could just tune out and skip it all. And if your only purpose in taking this course is to pass it <laughs> or to uh, get some grade in it and that's it, well, go ahead, tune out. Uh, but on the other hand, the material we're talking about is very relevant to where computers are today and where they're going in the future. And so if you think about the longer term and whatever your investment is in the computer industry and computer technology is, then I think you'll find these very worthwhile. Uh, but th so think of this more as the uh, icing on the cake. You've learned the hard stuff. You've, you've done the grinding part. And now you get to think beyond the sort of narrow confines of the course material and, and think bigger. But that's really the way you should be viewing this lecture and the last lecture, uh, which will be on Thursday. So today what we're going to talk about is parallelism. Um, and the issue is that... that um, Wow. <laughs> that PowerPoint is a uh, product made by a certain company in Seattle that it's not always reliable. But um, the issue is, as you know nowadays, when you buy a computer, you don't get just one uh, CPU on the processor chip. You have at least two on a typical laptop. Even my phone has uh, two. Uh, cores in it and as well as four graphic processing units and uh, a typical the, the next generation of iPad will be a six core processor so uh, these have become not just the the sort of specialized domain of of um, you know, high-end machines but actually uh, there all the time and actually we'll talk some next time what, why is it that uh, instead of having one fast computer, you get two uh, medium size, medium performance processors on a chip or more. And that, that's actually a really interesting technology issue that I'll talk about next time. But it's the way it is. So you can think of it, when you write a program uh, and it runs as a single thread, then you're basically not making use of the computing resources that you have available to you. So the natural thing is, well, could we make our programs run faster by doing uh, multiple threads? So you've already learned, or you're in the process of applying a multi-threaded uh, programming as a way to um, uh, deal with a concurrency of external events. There's multiple clients who want to make use of a server and instead of serving one and then another and then another, if you can handle them all, it's sort of uh, an external use of concurrency. But <clears throat> what we'll talk about today is more an internal use. Can I make use of multiple threads running on multiple cores to make a program run, a single program run faster? And the message behind that is yes, but. And what I mean is it is truly possible, and people spend a lot of time making programs run faster by using multiple threads. But it's harder than you'd think it should be. And it's fraught with, uh, as you've probably already experienced, programming bugs. But also, it's just really darn hard to get the kind of performance out of a multi-core processor that you, you should, would think it would be available. So we'll talk about some of that. And then we'll finish it up a, a little bit, understanding of how um, how, when you're writing concurrent programs, you want to think about uh, the, the state of memory and how that's a challenge for multi-core processors or, in fact, any concurrent, uh, concurrent system. So um, there's actually two sources of, of concurrency on a modern processor. Multiple cores, which is you have actually uh, a, a multiple CPUs on a single chip. But there's also something called hyper-threading, uh, which is, in my experience, less useful. But let me go through this. So this is uh, what a typical modern processor uh, looks like, processor chip, is that there's actually, on a single chip, 
there's multiple independent uh, CPUs. And um, each of them has some part of the hi cache hierarchy which is private to that particular um, core. And then there's another part of the cache hierarchy that's shared across cores. And then they all have a common interface to main memory. So if these cores are running, uh, and this is what happens a lot, is they're running programs that are completely independent, have nothing to do with each other, then they more or less just exist and run and they're uh, happy as can be. They each are caching parts of their own state and uh, you know, sometimes this cache will get polluted by the junk from other programs in terms of performance, but it won't uh, matter with functionality. The trick when you're trying to do multi-core programming as a parallel computing thing is somehow getting all these cores uh, working on uh, parts of a, uh, different parts of a single problem in a way that uh, makes it so that you get the performance out of it. They don't spend all their time basically arguing with each other about who has access to what. And also that they're not stepping over each other and messing up each other's state. So uh, hyper-threading is a little bit more uh, into the deep works of how a processor operates. You'll recall from the lecture on uh, uh, performance or what's chapter five of the book, that a modern microprocessor looks absolutely nothing like the model that you get by looking at assembly code instructions. The model of assembly code is you execute one instruction, then you execute the next one, then you execute the next one. Modern processors don't do that at all. They haven't done it for, um, well, they haven't done it that way for um, 30 years. <laughs> and since uh, 1995, so since 20 years, they do it in this totally different way, which is uh, sometimes referred to as out-of-order processing. And so just real quickly, the, the basic idea is on the processor chip, there's multiple functional units that are capable of doing different types of operation. There's ones for integer arithmetic, there's ones for floating point arithmetic, and so forth. And then there's separate uh, blocks that interface to the memory, actually to the cache memories. And they're uh, both loading, meaning reading from the memory, and storing, writing out to memory. Uh, but these units are sort of operate independently. And what happens is there's a block of logic, which is actually uh, an enormously huge block of logic in an x86 processor, that reads the instructions out of the instruction stream, rips them apart into little pieces, keeps track of data dependencies and control dependencies, and then schedules all the various operations in your program on these uh, different functional units. So we talked some about that of, in the context of how can you write a program that will sort of maximize uh, how much is going on down here um, by writing your code in a particular ways. <clears throat> so all this is an introduction uh, to say, uh, this is how you have to understand what hyperthreading is. So in a single uh, execution mode, there's basically one instruction decoder, and it has its own set of state here, its own program counter, its own uh, queue of, of operations that it's already decoded and haven't completed yet. It has its own set of registers. They're actually not registers like you'd expect. They're, uh, they're highly virtualized registers. But all this state is uh, there to help to, to service the execution of one thread of execution. With hyperthreading, basically what you do is, uh, the idea of it is to say, 90% of all programs don't really make use of all these functional units, especially if you're blocking on a load because uh, there's a miss in a cache, then all these arithmetic units are sitting there without any th useful work to do. Um, and so, why don't we just double up or quadruple up or uh, k times up the uh, state associated with the decoding and uh, control parts of the program so that you can have multiple threads running uh, and sharing these functional units among each other. So they're operating uh, really independently. Their, their states are not intertwined but they're sort of making more use of the, um, 
the available hardware for performing functions. And so that's called hyperthreading. That's an Intel term. You also sometimes hear it called SMT, simultaneous multi-threading. And in my experience, and we'll see here the numbers, it doesn't really make that big a difference, but it turns out to be in the, the sort of large picture of things, a relatively inexpensive feature for them to throw onto processors, and so they do it. And so nowadays, um, at least with an x86 processor, you usually have two-way hyper-threading in them. So given that, if you look at our Shark machines, which are a little bit old, they're sort of 2010 era machine, but they were high-end machines in their day, and so they still actually are more powerful than what you'd buy as, say, a desktop, and way more powerful than as a laptop uh, that you'd get today. So they're actually pretty decent machines. And actually, we'll talk next time about why computers aren't a lot faster than they were five years ago. That's actually an interesting technology thing. So uh, um, the, they, they're server class machines. So they have multiple cores, and they have eight of them, which is a lot. Um, you can buy. Um, 10 core machines, x86 machines uh, on a single chip, but I don't think you can get more yet. So uh, these were fairly advanced machine in their day, and they also have two-way hyper-threading. So in theory, um, you should be able to get 16 independent threads running, sort of 16-way parallelism, potentially out of a program, if you can keep everything working and keep bad things from uh, happening. So let's give a really trivial uh, application, one that should be very simple to make go run in parallel. And that says, imagine we want to sum up the numbers between 0 and n minus 1, which is, by the way, a really stupid thing to do because there's a very simple closed form formula for it which is good in the sense it will let us check our work, but it's a completely stupid application, uh, but it just shows you this idea. And so what we're just going to do is, is block off, if we have n-way uh, parallelism, we're just going to split our range of numbers uh, n-ways and just uh, have uh, a single thread sum up one nth of the numbers, and then they'll collectively sum together the results in some way or another. So this is about as easy a parallel program as you could imagine. So let's do uh, one version which is said, well gee, I understand how to use threads, uh, p-threads, and I know about these things called semaphores or uh, mutual exclusion. So what I'll do is just I'll, I'll uh, have one place in memory where I'm collecting the sum over all n values, and for a thread to be able to add to that, if it uh, it will lock it, it will get a mutual exclusive access to it, increment it, and then unlock it. And we'll just let all the threads go helter-skelter, locking and unlocking this. So the code for that's pretty easy to write. It's, it's uh, um, here's the, the code, and of course all threaded code looks a lot messier than you think it should, but in the end it's a fairly straightforward code. So in particular, this is the thread routine, is uh, passing through this weird varg uh, p structure that you do with, with um, uh, threads, the way you pass arguments to a, a thread routine. But basically it's figuring out where's the start and end range of the numbers, then adding um, for all i between the start and before the end, I'll uh, lock that uh, acquire a semaphore lock, I'll increment this global sum, and then I'll release the lock. Okay, so uh, pretty much the style of code that you've been working with. And what you find is actually this is really a bad idea. <laughs> so running as a single thread, it takes 51 seconds to do that. It would be, by the way, if you didn't lock and unlock, because it's only one thread, you'd blow this away. It would take just a couple of seconds. So, and then you see, as you add more threads, it actually gets worse. Uh, and especially if you jump from one to two, you uh, increase by a factor of nine how much time it takes. 
<clears throat> and it only starts to get better as you get up into eight threads and then it gets worse again. So th the reason is that um, locking and unlocking is a very time consuming task and basically you can think of is that you if you have that map of the multi-core processors with all their private caches and one shared cache, these threads are basically fighting with each other for control for that one uh, memory address that, they, uh, that they're um, incrementing. And it has to grab the control away from one core to your, the core that's uh, accessing it, do the lock, unlock, and then it gets grabbed back for it. So it's a miserable performance for cache huge overhead for the semaphore activities and just really a bad thing all around. And so lesson one is uh, semaphores or mutexes are very expensive. Uh, and if you're trying to do low level uh, parallelism, you don't want fine grain locking um, at that level. Otherwise, you're just completely sunk. And so uh, that's not the way to do it. Uh, I won't go into it, but there's quite a bit of literature about what they call lock-free synchronization which is a way to avoid semaphores but get the effect. And they wouldn't work in this context either. Those, uh, just if you've ever heard that term, those are generally designed for uh, examples where you expect relatively little contention between the threads and so you try and be optimistic and then roll back if something bad happens. Um, this is a case where, nope, all those threads are going to be pounding that one memory location and they're really fighting for it. And so there's no good solution to that problem. Um, the other thing I'll point out is this jump here shows you that uh, hyperthreading isn't really helping us here. Um, going from the fact that we slow down from 8 to 16 means we can't really make use of 16 threads in this application. Uh, eight threads are better than four, uh, but obviously all of that's kind of a waste of time because this is just really a bad idea all around. So. Let's uh, do something different. Let's have each of them accumulate their own sum for their own subrange. Uh, and we'll give a, so we'll have an array of accumulators where the, um, uh, each thread is incrementing only uh, one element of this array. Uh, so they're not fighting with each other directly for it, but they are fighting for, if you think about it, for the same uh, cache line because an array is typically stored and so it's not totally nice. Uh, but this it's, gives you a pointer to this idea of, if we could sort of move into a private state the stuff that we're making the most direct access to, uh, then we'll get better performance. So this is the thread routine and the, the point is that there's some global array called PSUM but it's only incrementing the, the part of it that's sort of assigned to this particular thread. And here you do see a performance improvement, right? So one thread takes five seconds. Remember before it was 58. So that shows you just the advantage of uh, the, the cost of semaphores um, right there as a factor at 10. And you see you are actually getting an improvement all across the line, including up to 16 threads. You're still getting an improvement. It would flatten out. I should have shown the number for 32, but it would flatten out at this point. Uh, but it actually is getting some advantage out of hyperthreading as well. So that's good. Um, it's not an amazing speed up. So uh, you can think of what they call the speed up is the performance of it running on a single core versus the performance on n cores. And in the ideal case, it goes n times faster. Uh, and we're not quite hitting that. <clears throat> Uh, but here's, uh, you've already learned that it's generally bad to be accumulating into a memory. And so why not do the thing we learned before, which is you accumulate in a register and you only update the memory when you're done with that. So let's just do that and I'll call that the local version. I'll just uh, increment a sum, which is a local variable. And only when I'm done, then I'll store it in the... Um, global array. Okay, so it's functionally equivalent to the one we just showed. We're just moving, instead of accumulating in a global array, we're accumulating in a, a register. And here you see a pretty big performance improvement. So 
Blue is what we showed with the, the global array. Uh, red or orange is what's this uh, a local variable. And so you see it, it's actually interesting. We're getting a performance improvement as well, uh, although uh, it bottoms out at 8, and it actually gets worse when you go to 16. And this is showing that hyperthreading isn't really helping here because basically the, the single thread is just accumulating as fast as it can and adding to a, a, a register. And so it's making pretty good use of what functional units it uses. And putting multiple threads, uh, sharing it isn't really helping. At least not on the um, uh, shark machines. This actually might be different on different machines. Uh, and actually, if you recall from the performance optimization, we found that if you're just doing a bunch of additions, you can make use of associativity and, and uh, get more accumulation in parallel. So you could actually speed up this program, just at the single-threaded version of this program, pretty well. But anyways, it shows that, okay, this is starting to look uh, like your, your A, your single-threaded performance is pretty good, and B, you're getting some useful speed-up out of... Uh, parallelism. But as I said, this is like the easiest example in the world to parallelize. So if you can't do it here, then, then life is pretty hopeless as far as uh, multi-threading. So let's talk about, uh, as I mentioned, this idea of speed up. So speed up is just defined to be the time for a single threaded program divided by the time for, uh, for P threads uh, running, or actually uh, we'll use it P cores instead of P threads. Question. Does the CPU always schedule different threads to run on different cores? Um, ge yes, generally. You know, the scheduler has some kind of load balancing built into it, and it will uh, tend to, especially in a case like this where the threads are sort of grabbing and running, uh, making th they, they will uh, generally get spread across the, the cores. So that's a pretty, the Linux scheduler is pretty good at that. When you have more threads than there are um, cores, then, uh, th then it, it basically starts scheduling them in some cyclic order. And you, you won't, you'll, at best, you will not get any advantage. And in the worst case, you'll actually start slowing down from having more threads than are there. Good question. So there's really two versions of speed up. One is if I take my multi-threaded routine and run it with one thread, and then I met, do it with P threads or cores, I can get a speed up. But actually, the truer thing is if I take the best known sequential algorithm for performing this task with the best implementation of that, and then I compare it against my parallel one. So that's referred to as absolute speed up. Uh, which is the, the best measure is, you know, you give both sides the opportunity to do the best implementation that they, they can and then you compare it. And then what's referred to as the efficiency is how close does the speed up get to the ideal speed up, which is if I'm running on P cores, I should be P times faster. And you'll see that we're, you know, the question of hyperthreading versus not, we're sort of here, we're saying, no, you don't, we're not trying to a gain from hyperthreading. You can play this game in various ways and you can argue back and forth um, whether hyperthreading should count. So for P, is P the total number of possible threads or the total number of cores? That's really a, a, something to, to uh, argue back and forth about. So the, the point is the efficiency, though, is, is measured as uh, how much do we do relative to um, Ideal, and so this is what you get for this uh, code, the local version of PSUM. You'll see that our efficiency numbers are somewhere in the high 70 range, which is good but not great. It's pretty good actually. If you can get 75% efficiency, you're doing better than most. But again, that's because this should have been the world's easiest program to parallelize. <clears throat> so. Um, and, and the best speed up we're getting is a factor of six out of eight cores. So again, that's pretty good, but this really should be something you can do uh, well. 
So uh, that just gives you a flavor of, of uh, what parallel uh, computing can be. So now let's sort of back off and talk some general principles, just like the speed up. Um, there's a fellow named Gene Namdahl who coincidentally just died a few weeks ago. You might have seen it in the news. He was one of the original pioneers uh, at IBM in their mainframe computers. And then at some point he, um, uh, in the 60s, he started his own company called Amdahl Computers, and they were like, they were the, the cool company in mainframe computers, if that could ever be considered cool, right? <laughs> uh, and he built a competitors to uh, IBM that absolutely drove them crazy, because they had a, a virtual monopoly. They actually were the subject of an antitrust um, suit. So Amdahl was a sort of the, the rebel who broke away from the mother company and started a competitor. Um, and he made this very simple observation that's called Amdahl's Law, which is uh, basically junior high level algebra to think of this, but it's actually a fairly perceptive point uh, about what's the possible benefit of speeding up something. And this is discussed in the book. You know, this isn't just for computers. It's any process that you want to speed up. And it's a very simple observation, which is suppose there's some fraction of a system that I can make go faster. And I'll call that fraction P. P is a, some number between 0 and 1.0, right? 100%, 0%. And let's suppose we take that part that we're going to make run faster and improve its performance by a factor of k. Um, then we can just very simply talk about what will be the uh, benefit of that performance. So we'll call it T sub k. And what it says is the fraction p of the time uh, will be reduced by k, uh, but the fraction that you can't change, uh, 1 minus p, will remain at its old time. And that's Amdahl's law. <laughs> that's it. That's the whole thing. And one interesting measure is uh, what if k were infinity? What if we had unbounded resources to speed things up? And um, uh, what's the, the observation is the best speed up you'll get is a 1 minus p. Uh, so just think of it this way. If you have 10% of it that you can't change, the other 90% you make infinitely fast, then your performance improvement will be a factor of 10. That's really all it's saying, right? Pretty straightforward idea. So this has sort of direct implications in, uh, so the example is uh, suppose that we can improve the performance of some system of 90% of it, uh, and we can speed up by a factor of 9, and that number is chosen to make the numbers work out. Then we'll get at best a 2x performance improvement. Uh, basically what it says is the part of the system that you can't speed up will become your bottleneck. And uh, that's just the way it is. So the implications for this for parallel programming are fairly obvious. That if we can take our application and chop off some fraction of it and make it run k times faster by running it on k cores, then uh, the part of it that's still uh, running sequentially will come to, uh, will limit the ultimate performance we can get. So that's not really an issue for this uh, summation problem because it really does divide into as many independent tasks as, as you have uh, numbers and as you can see you can make them run but many other applications there's some part of it that I can't really make go parallel. So uh, just as an example and just for the sake of this class you know an example of a little bit more involved a problem in parallel programming and multi-threading Let's think about uh, sorting a bunch of numbers. So we have n numbers, and we want to sort them. Um, uh, and we have uh, uh, some number of, of threads that we can do this with. Is there a way we can speed this up? And you think about it, it's not that clear how you would do it. There's actually a vast literature in parallel sorting. Uh, and those of you who've taken or will take the class 210 will be exposed to a lot of this. Uh, but I'm just going to do a very simple version, which is quicksort. So quicksort is, for example, the, um, the uh, C library program QSort is quicksort. It was invented 
in the uh, early 1960s or 1950s by a guy named Tony Hoare, who also founded a lot of the fundamental logic of programs. So he's like an amazing person, still alive today. Uh, he lives in Cambridge, England. But um, and if you ever have a chance to go to a talk by him, do so. He's an amazing person. Anyways, the idea of quicksort is very simple, and uh, this is sort of the basic sorting algorithm. You grab some element from the array that you're trying to sort, and that's called the pivot. And then you split the data so that you look at the elements that are either uh, greater or less than the pivot, and potentially also equal. Let's just assume all the elements are uh, unique here. So you just split it into two uh, piles. One is the less than, one's the greater. Now recursively, you, recursively, you sort those two piles uh, by the same method, and when it's all done, you'll end up with everything sorted. One nice thing about it is it can be done in place, meaning if you have an array of data, you can do this all just by swapping elements around and not have to use any extra space, which you would, for example, with merge sort. So this is a... Um, fairly simple algorithm, and just to visualize it then, you have some block of data X array and you want to sort it. So you pick an element called the pivot and there's various strategies for doing that. And now you just uh, subdivide uh, X into three parts. L, the left hand, R, the right hand, meaning less and greater than P, and then you place P in the middle. And then you recursively, uh, when you're doing this for in a sequential code, you'll pick one of these two, usually you leftmost or rightmost, whatever, doesn't really matter. And you'll recursively, you'll apply the same um, method to, to uh, the left side. And ultimately, after enough recursions, you get to the point where L has been sorted, and that's shown in this kind of uh, swishy color thing, and call that L prime. And same with, um, You'll do the, the same thing now with the right-hand side. And when you're done, this is usually done in place. So you're just, uh, the L part works on one array, part of the array, and the R part on another. And when you're done, they're in sorted order. It's a very simple sort and generally has very good performance. So uh, this is what the code for it looks like, which is uh, usually you have as a special case if there's only one or two elements. And then uh, you do this partitioning. So this routine of splitting it between the left and the right-hand part is handled by a function called partition. And then if there's more than one element in the left side, you uh, sort that. And if there's more than one element in the right-hand side, you sort that. And uh, then when all these recursions are done, then the, the array is sorted. So pretty typical code. And we won't go in the trickiest part writing the code is how do you make this partitioning go uh, a fast, but uh, I won't go into that. Just imagine it happens. So this algorithm actually has a natural version of parallelism, which is in my sequential version, I was sorting both the, first the left and then the left of the left and the left of the left of the left and kind of working my way until I got that whole array sorted. And then I was coming back and I was working on the right and then the left part of the right and the left of the left of the right and blah, blah, blah. And doing these recursions because the way the code's written, right, I am doing the full sort of the left-hand part and only after that is sorted, then I'm doing the complete sort of the right-hand part. So uh, the point is it's, it's an algorithm where uh, I'm working just on one part of the array at a time. But there's a very natural recursion, uh, parallelism here that says, okay, I've got two parts. They each be, need to be sorted. Let me just uh, fire off two threads and let them uh, deal with that. And that's, uh, the, so that's it, what you call divide and conquer parallelism. It's a very natural uh, kind of parallelism that shows up in this code. So, Basically, I'll do the same thing as before. I'll, I'll, at the top level, it will be a purely sequential process of partitioning. And, um, uh, but then assuming a partition comes up with some non-trivial split, then I will recursively uh, begin, uh, fork off two threads, 
each of which will be responsible for the other. And so it will sort of look like I'm working on the two parts in parallel. And eventually both uh, sides will end up. Now this picture isn't really quite true in that it look, makes it look like they're all kind of synchronized together and I'm doing, uh, you know, kaboom down like this in a strict way. But in fact they're not. It's very asynchronous. The left part is one thread, the right is another. They just go at their own pace and at the end I'm just going to wait for it all to complete. Uh, but there's no strict uh, temporal ordering on how that all occurs. So uh, the way I'll write this, and the code is available um, on the course website. I'm only going to show you a glimpse of it. it it's a non-trivial amount of code it takes to do it. But basically what I'm going to do is have a, a bunch of, a pool of threads that are ready to uh, work. And that's a pretty typical way you write threaded code. Uh, because actually the, the, the initiation of a thread is a non-trivial amount of computation. So usually what you do is you say I've got this many cores, I'm going to uh, create a, a set of that many threads, and they will each uh, work by uh, sharing a task queue, so some uh, agent that is uh, uh, forking off work for the different uh, threads to do. They will do the work assigned to them. When that's complete, they'll come back and say, okay, I'm ready for something new, and it will give them something new. So I've, there's a little bit of code, a very rudimentary uh, code there of, of creating this task model and task scheduling. So the basic rule will be any given task, any given thread that at any given time has been assigned some sub-range of this array to be uh, uh, sorting. And it uh, will be specified by the base, meaning the starting point of uh, this particular uh, range, and then the number of elements that it's uh, 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 told to sort. <clears throat> and uh, one other thing I'll do is once I um, get down to this array being small enough, I'll just sort it uh, sequentially. Uh, and, and we'll see. How, how big that block is or not is actually a performance parameter that you can use for tuning the program. So the point is that you don't want to take this down too far because um, the, the sort of overhead of threads is enough that when you get too fine grained you're actually going to start losing performance. So assume that it's bigger than that. I've been given some block there. What I'll do then is um, I'll run the partition step uh, this thread will run its a partition step just using the exact function I showed you or didn't show you. Uh, and then as long as, and then I will uh, uh, create and add to the task queue two new tasks, uh, one to th uh, for the left part and one for the right part. And then the scheduler that will assign two uh, threads uh, to handle those two parts. And so that code will, that's exactly how the code's going to work. It's going to um, keep reusing the same threads over and over again, uh, to, but at any given time they'll be given a, a range of places. What typically will happen is they'll run their partitioning step and then say, okay, I've done my job, now uh, assign to new, two new threads to do this. And that's the general scheme of it. Or they'll say, this is a small enough block, I'm just going to sort the darn thing. Okay, so that's really all the code does. It's online. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, it's, uh, I think it's pretty well written code because I wrote it. <laughs> so uh, this is sort of the, the uh, uh, a somewhat simplified version of the code. It's say, uh, initialize my task uh, queue scheduling system. Uh, uh, create global variables of uh, describing the beginning and end of this uh, array to be sorted, uh, create a new task queue, and then this is the main function. The TQ sort helper uh, is given some range of, um, of addresses and a pointer to the task queue uh, that's used to manage these tasks. <clears throat> and then uh, um, 
uh, when it's all done, it will just wait till all the tasks have completed. This is uh, the top level. This isn't part of any recursion. This is the top level uh, code. And then it will free up the data structures. Uh, and then this is the, the, the part of it that actually does the real work. It will say, uh, so now the uh, TQ sort helper is the part that's assigned to, uh, to sort some particular range of uh, places from uh, the, the starting address, the base, and some number of elements. Uh, and so this is what each uh, task will do. And it says, okay, if, if this is a small enough block of elements, I'm just going to call my uh, serial quicksort to do it. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to um, um, Oh, it's a little bit messier than this. Okay. Uh, now, otherwise, it's going to uh, spawn a task to do the sorting. Let's see. I, I was a little mixed up. This is a, a high level. So the actual splitting occurs in this thing, which is uh, <clears throat> where it's... Um, so this is the actual thread routine. And what it's saying is um, run the partition here and then uh, call this TQ sort helper, which you just saw on the left and the right parts of it. So just to, to review then, the actual spawning of a task is done by this helper routine, but then that, uh, what it calls is the, the thread routine is what does the work here. And what it will do is it will do the partitioning within that thread and then it will just throw back and add to the task queue um, <clears throat> uh, two calls to this uh, helper. Uh, but it has that kind of, so between these two routines, you can see it's doing this idea of a divide and conquer parallelism. So this is a performance running on the um, shark machines. And uh, this is a fairly uh, straightforward, I'm, I'm just taking some number of random value, 2 to the 37th. Um, that can't be right. This is number is not 2 to the 37th, right? Do you agree with me? 2 to the 37th is 128 billion, roughly. So this number is not right. I'll have to check it out. Um, and now what this. Uh, X -axis, so the y-axis just denotes how long does it take to complete. Uh, by the way, one thing, if you're used to measuring performance based on CPU time, that's not useful when you're talking a parallel computing. You really want to talk elapsed time, the time that you'd get from looking at a clock and measuring it and uh, dealing with whatever inefficiency occurs there. So these are actually the elapsed runtime of the entire program. Uh, and you'll see that it varies according to this thing called the serial fraction. The serial fraction is just uh, at what point do I slide between a uh, serial quick sort or keep uh, dividing? So how big does the array need to be as a fraction expressed as a fraction of the original array uh, before I, um, I will uh, go into recursion. If I were actually to write this as a real application, I wouldn't do it based on a fraction. I'd do it based on a block size to say anything smaller than a thousand elements or some number like that. But uh, this code it just happens to be expressed this way. But the, the thing to notice that's interesting is you'll see here uh, if the fraction is one, it basically says I won't split this at all. I'm just going to call uh, sequential quick sort. So this is a purely sequential version of it. And what it shows is if I, uh, once I start to uh, be willing to sort of split this up and uh, do parallelism, I start making it run faster and faster and faster. Uh, and then I get into this trough. And now if I start uh, going finer and finer grain, then I'm running into the problem where the thread overhead is uh, more than the advantage I'm getting by doing the parallelism. And I'm, I'm faster to run that block, big a sort, just using a 
sequential algorithm rather than parallel. <clears throat> but the good news here is this is a pretty long trough here. It, so it means is if you're trying to tune this program, um, it's not that hard. You're not going to pay a huge penalty if you don't nail the parameter exactly. So as long as, because this is a huge range, right? 30, from a 32 to 4096, that's a factor of, um, of uh, a lot. 2 to the 5th and 2 to the 12th is 2 to the 7th. Factor 128. <laughs> See how I do my arithmetic and uh, powers at 2. Uh, anyways, there's roughly a, you know, 128. So several orders of magnitude, decimal orders of magnitude over which you get pretty comparable performance. So that means from a performance tuning point of view, it's not that hard to do. And you'll also see we're getting a pretty decent speed up. Um, on our eight core two-way hyper-threaded machine, we're getting uh, basically a 7x performance. And uh, hyper-threading really isn't helping us at all is, is part of the lesson here. But if you just think of it as eight cores, then that's pretty good. So um, there is an obvious place here where there's a, an Amdahl's law issue going on. If you think at that first top level split, the first call to partition is being done over the entire array by a serial sequential process. Right? And that, so at the very least, that is not going parallel at all. There's going exactly one thread is doing the initial partition. And then that splits into two. So at most, you have two threads worth of parallelism. And then the next level down at most four. And so you really don't, you have to get several levels of recursion down before you're really running on all the cores that you have available. So you'd think that that's limiting your speed up, and it does, and that's part of the reason why our best performance is um, a factor of seven and not a factor of eight or more. So um, there's quite a bit of, of work, as I mentioned, on how to uh, uh, speed up performance, including how to make quicksort go faster. Uh, so there's a vast uh, body of literature on parallel sorting. So one thing I tried was to say, okay, well, let's try and do this partitioning um, step, at least the top couple levels. Let's try and uh, do a, a parallel version of that. And so the idea is you pick one pivot element, but now you fire, up in this example, four threads. And each of those four threads runs a partition step on, on uh, one-fourth of the range. And it, they'll generate their own versions of left and right. And then you globally figure out uh, how many uh, are in each of these sub-ranges. And then you tell each thread, okay, now you copy your part of it over to the relevant section of the array. <clears throat> but the good news, so there's some amount of uh, synchronization that goes on there, but you can imagine that uh, this partitioning step, once, when you're running it, is completely independent of uh, across the different threads, so it's getting a almost ideal speed up. So I implemented this and tried, and I couldn't make it run faster than the original code. And I think the, the problem with this was the copying. The cost of copying data uh, here uh, was, uh, even though it's being done by multiple threads and getting pretty good performance out of the memory system because you're doing sequent copying, you know, all the cache issues are, are pretty good here. But that's just enough extra work that has to be done for this parallel code that doesn't have to be done. The sequential code is totally in place, meaning not using any additional storage, not copying. And so that's just enough of a penalty on the parallel part that it didn't really uh, improve performance at all. So that code is shown as part of the code on the uh, course website. But like I said, I, I banged on it quite a bit and tried to uh, tune it and squeak it in various ways and could never make it so I got better overall performance uh, out of this program. And so that's again a lesson, and, and that's un one of the unfortunate lessons, is you can spend a lot of time 
trying to make a program run faster and get absolutely nowhere. <laughs> and it's frustrating because you put in a lot of work and you know it's a pretty cool idea and you'd love to publish a paper about it or tell your friends about it and it just goes nowhere and it just sits there and there's nothing, un unfortunately there's not an accumulated repository of the bad ideas of computer science, don't waste your time trying this, uh, that people can talk about. So uh, this is just uh, a lesson to learn. So uh, anyways, that was uh, my experience with that. Uh, again, other people have spent a lot more time, this is one of the most common uh, applications that people try to do parallel programming for. So uh, some of the lessons from this is you need a good strategy for how you're going to get parallelism out of your application. And I showed you uh, two basic versions. One is partitioned into k parts that are more or less completely independent of each other or something like a divide and conquer strategy where you can keep splitting it but the two splits that you uh, create out of that can go concurrently. There's other different uh, types of parallelism too. Uh, in general you want to make the inner loops, you can't have any synchronization primitives in there, it will just run too slow. Uh, Amdahl's law as I mentioned is always sort of lurking in the background of if you can only speed up a part of your program, then the other part will become the bottleneck. Uh, but the other thing is, uh, like I said, you can do it. You've got the tools, you've learned uh, with, with pthreads and your knowledge of programming and your understanding of cache memories and things like that. You've got the tools you need to be an effective uh, programmer of, of this kind of thing. But you have to, and there's nothing that beats sort of trial and error and testing and tuning experimenting, you, if there's some parameters that need to be set then you want to run experiments that will sweep through the parameters to try and figure out uh, what the setting should be. So that's sort of uh, a little bit about parallel programming. Let me just finish this uh, lecture with a little bit of sort of classic uh, issues about concurrency that, that are uh, critical when you're dealing with uh, these systems are uh, based on uh, what you call a shared memory model of computation. So multi-core is an example of conceptually uh, multi-threaded computation, remember you're, you're working within a single virtual address space and uh, you have private stacks but the more global the heap memory uh, is completely shared across threads and so that's uh, what you call the shared memory uh, programming model and that's what we've really been looking at in this course. So uh, there's a sort of interesting question about, called memory consistency models and here I'll illustrate it with a very simple example. Imagine we have uh, two global variables A and B and we have two different threads and so the first thread is going to write uh, meaning assign a value to A and it's going to read meaning print the value of, of B. And the other thread is going to do the opposite. It's going to write, assign a value to B, and print the value of A. And so now the question is, what are the possible outputs uh, for this program? And so there's a, a, a model that's sort of the accepted standard called sequential consistency, which means that these events can occur, well, the, these, uh, the, within a single thread, things have to occur in the sequential order of that thread. But across threads, whether write A or write B occurs first is completely arbitrary. And similarly, whether writing of B occurs uh, between these two actions or before uh, <clears throat> is also arbitrary. So what, you, what it means is you can take two different threads and you can interleave their, their events in any way, but uh, you should be able to pull out of that interleaving the sequential order of either of both of the two threads. So when you do that, you end up, uh, you can enumerate in an example like this, all the possibilities. You can say, well look it, first is either going to be right A or right B. Let's pick right A. So now the next event will be either a read of B or a write of B. And then if, uh, if I do write A, write read B, then I've completed this thread. 
And so now the only possibility is to write to B and read A and uh, so forth. You work out all the possible things. You'll get six different event orderings. And then uh, what will be printed is, well, first of all, whether you print B or before A uh, will depend on the relative ordering of those two threads. So that's shown, I'm showing the B value in blue and the red value in, in red, the, I'm sorry, the A value in red. And you'll get these different uh, possibilities. These are all the six possible outputs of this program. But you'll see that there are two, two other outputs one could imagine that won't arise. Uh, one is uh, to print uh, 101. In other words, to have them both print uh, the original values of these two variables. And that's impossible because I have to have done at least one right uh, before I can reach either of these two print statements, right? So it's not possible for these to still be in their original values uh, when I hit uh, these print statements. Uh, and whichever order I, I hit these two. So those two are, are impossible. So that's the idea of sequential consistency, that there's some uh, very large number but, uh, of possible outputs of a program, but in any case, they can't violate the ordering implied by the individual threads. <clears throat> so you'd say, okay, duh, that seems like a pretty obvious thing. Um, but actually, if you think from a hardware perspective, it's not that trivial to make that happen. So let me just uh, throw, send, uh, show you a scenario of multi-core hardware that would violate sequential consistency. Uh, assume that each of our threads has its own private cache. And so if I uh, uh, execute this statement, what I'll do is I will grab a copy of A from the uh, main memory and bring it into my cache and I will assign this new value to it. And similarly, uh, thread 2 will grab a copy of its uh, of B and, and update that. And now if I um, do my two print statements, if thread 2 picks up the value from the memory, not knowing that thread 1 has a modified copy of that value, then it would naturally print 1. And Similarly, if, if thread 1 picked up a copy of B from main memory, it would print 100. So we'd see exactly this uh, unallowable execution. And the reason is because each of these threads have their own private copies of these vari shared variables, and they're not um, properly synchronized. But you could see in a hardware scenario, it would be easy to build this hardware and make that mistake. So how does it work in a, in a uh, multi-core processor. Well, they have a trick, they call it uh, Snoopy caches. And it's a little bit like the reader's writer's uh, uh, synchronization that you're working on for your proxies. That you want to make it so that if everyone's just reading some shared value, they should be able to get copies into their own caches to optimize the performance of it. But if one of them wants to write to it, it needs to get an exclusive copy of it and lock out any other thread from uh, accessing that, either to read it or to write it, um, for long enough to make the update. And so um, <clears throat> uh, they, they have a protocol where they tag, actually, and these tags are uh, at the level of cache lines, typically. So they'll tag a cache line in main memory with its state, and the typical state would be invalid, it's shared, uh, or ex it's exclusive. So shared means that there can be uh, uh, copies of it, but they can only be re read-only copies. And exclusive meaning that it's um, uh, uh, exclusively available to a single thread. So uh, this is built into then the hardware of a multi-core processor. So what will happen then is uh, in order to do a write to A, thread one will acquire an exclusive copy of this um, element. And that actually tagging happens down here at the main memory and in the cache both. Uh, 
and similarly, if, if thread 2 wants a, uh, uh, to write to B, it must get an exclusive copy of that. And then when uh, the read occurs, what happens is actually this cache, miss, will send out a signal on a bus, a shared uh, communication medium saying, I want to read A. And instead of the main memory responding to it, actually it will, uh, that uh, result will be supplied by the other cache. And it will convert the state of this element to being a shared element uh, locally, but you'll see that the main memory element isn't updated yet. It goes through the whole uh, write back protocol you've already seen. Or, and sometimes it will update that. There's different implementations. But this is why it's called a Snoopy cache, is that it basically thread two is, is peeking into or getting access to information that's available in thread one's cache. And uh, so now thread two will correctly get a, a copy of A uh, that's in the shared state. And the same goes with B. It will snoop over and thread two will, one will get a readable copy. These are now all marked as shared state. And so if, um, if uh, either of them wanted to write, they'd have to now basically get exclusive access to it and that would have to then disable uh, the copy in the other um, in the other location. So you can imagine this protocol being non-trivial actually to get right and to implement. And it gets way more complicated than this with all the variations on it. Uh, so, but it's become a, the norm in, in uh, multi-core hardware design. Uh, but it's actually part of the factor that limits the core count on a processor uh, because just the hardware involved in keeping the consistency across the caches is, is non-trivial. It has to work very fast. We're talking at the cache rate uh, access speeds. So uh, there's not a lot of time involved in there. So actually implementing this stuff, making it run, making it scale across say eight cores, 10 cores, 16 cores is not a, not a trivial thing. But that, that goes on in the background and so you can, uh, for most systems nowadays, you can assume uh, that there's uh, some memory consistency model that you can program to that's supported by the hardware of the system. And the, this uh, serial, serializability that's referred to is sort of the, the easiest to understand. There's others that are a little bit more nuanced. Whoop, I guess that fell off the bottom here. That doesn't seem right. Nope, that's it. Okay, so just to wrap that up then, um, it gives you a flavor of, of um, uh, and you can see that, that getting programs to run fast through multi-threading is not, not easy. You often have to rewrite your application, you have to think about the algorithm, you have to worry about debugging it. As you've already discovered at both the, the shell lab and the proxy lab that Concurrency, where you can't predict the order of events, makes it much more difficult to uh, debug code. So all these factors come in, um, and you have to have some understanding of the underlying mechanisms that are used and what their performance implications are. So in particular, let me just observe here that if I'm uh, like doing synchronization, uh, across threads, like you saw that original one where they are fighting over this global variable uh, p sum or whatever it was called, you can imagine these the caches uh, in this battle with each other to try and get exclusive access to this uh, single uh, memory uh, value, and because um, uh, each one is running as fast as it possibly can, try, but each one requires getting exclusive copy, <coughs> writing to it, and releasing it. So that locking mechanism is flying back and forth between these caches, and it's really not very fast. So uh, that's, that kind of thing is why, uh, uh, and also, you know, as an application programmer, you're making calls, um, uh, semaphore call bounces you up into the OS kernel, which is a cost involved. 
So this thing has all the bad, uh, all the things that make programs uh, not run the way you'd really like them to. So uh, that's one of the, the challenges in parallel programming is how do you actually uh, make use of the parallelism that's there without getting bogged down by uh, the cost of the various mechanisms of control. Uh, so anyways, this is part of what you have to appreciate and understand as a programmer is how these things work at a level deep enough that you'll have some sense of what makes you know, programs run faster or slower where the mistakes could lie. So uh, that's just a little, little flavor of a much bigger topic. So that's it for today.